Well, welcome everybody. It's 10 o'clock in the morning here in Utah, Mountain Time. And I'm going to start up this broadcast on time, which is kind of surprising for this business. Uh, I'm uh, My name is Jim. Let me take the uh, screen share off just for a minute so I can say hi. Um, I'm a, a guy, there's my camera. The camera's supposed to be up there, but um, I'm finding that Google Hangouts and Linux don't get along too well. Um, one of the problems that we're going to have is that I'd like to show you some RStudio stuff, but RStudio, when I screen share particular windows, everything works. Um, last time I did this as a live talk, uh, when I screen shared, my whole desktop didn't show up, just the one monitor of two, so I was able to just blow up RStudio on that window. Now, due to the vagaries of, of Google Hangouts or whatever, uh, when I try to show off my desktop, it shows the whole wide uh, two two screen desktop, so that's not going to work. So at the end of this presentation, what we're going to do is we're going to actually go and try to install RStudio server. That'll just be a little bit of a bonus. That's not a plan, but what RStudio server does, and I'll explain R and everything as we go through this. Um, let me just do a little more introduction, and then I'll give you an overview of what we're going to do. And, and Again, I, this is being done live as a Hangout. This is a plan to uh, do this Hangout on a weekly basis, at least for the next couple weeks, and then once my school semester starts, I'll see how things go. Now, what I was explaining about R is R, there's something called R, R Studio Server, which you install on a Linux server, and then it lets you access R Studio, which is the IDD, IDE for R. You can access it through a web browser. So we'll do that at the end. But this talk overall is about data science. It's about the different tools and things you need to know about data science. Let me go ahead and uh, I'm going oh, to explain this shirt real quick. If you look at the back of this shirt, uh, big, data, big Mountain Data and NoSQL, that was a, that's where I gave this talk originally. This is the first half of the talk I gave. And then I gave a, a previous version of this talk at a show called Open West in May. And I basically screwed up the Google Hangout part of that talk. If you look on my channel, you'll see the video from that. And as soon as I get this week and next week done, I'm going to kill that other video. Now I'm actually just focused on you, the home audience. Uh, there's not a lot of people here right now, which is what I expected. But this will be archived for people to watch. So whenever you're watching this, I do appreciate it. Uh, what I, what I, the, the feedback I've gotten on this talk, and let me go ahead and go over to the slides here, do a little bit of introductory type of stuff. The feedback I've got from these uh, is that people seem to like the talk. I get a lot of good feedback, but then some people don't, um, they don't think I did a deep dive on anything. Well, that's fair enough. This talk's not intended to be a deep, a deep dive. Um, as you see on the slide here, I'm a student at the University of Utah, I'm a math major focusing on statistics, and then I have a CS minor, and my emphasis on, is on statistics and machine learning. Now, jameslosey.com at the moment is not a proper website, but I will get things posted there probably by the time you watch this video. Um, I have this new website, jim at megalearningllc.com. Uh, there's a phone number you can reach me at, and I, am, I was actually running under the name of supportml, um, as a quick, just a little more background, uh, just to let you get settled in and get your coffee going there, which I have done. There, I was doing something named support ML, which means support machine learning. Uh, I was writing a new, I, was, I published a paper when I was at Utah Valley University about using machine learning in tech support. And it was kind of a funny story. This, this relates to why this talk uh, exists. So let me just tell this story for a minute, and then we'll move on. I had actually gone and uh, taken a class called data mining, and I was the only student. It's kind of a long story, but data mining is not very popular with the CS students. I guess video games are a much more popular thing. So I, uh, I, I signed up for this class. On the first day of class, there was only two students. Only three were registered, and then I was the only student that stuck it out. So we turned it into an independent study class. One of the things we did was to present a research paper in Seattle at a conference about using machine learning and tech support. I won't talk about that today, but I'll probably do a video about that in the future. Uh, we also did a project that led to this talk. There was a conference down there called Open West in May, and I presented this talk. And then I actually represented this talk, like I mentioned, at the Utah Geek Event Conference November 21st, and that's the genesis of this shirt. We, um, they're putting these cute little Star Wars-like um, slogans. So there was like five different slogans you were supposed to get your shirt. 
Well, let me go ahead and, sh and show the slides again, and we'll start moving through this talk. Again, I really appreciate your being here to watch this. Now, the, the reason for the talk, as I started studying big data and data science, I, got, I, I did some of the Coursera courses. Those are pretty cool. You can look at Coursera and look up uh, the Johns Hopkins uh, sequence on data science courses. They have a nice little introduction to the R programming language. Uh, later on in these slides, I say that, py that Python is the big thing, but R is also really the big thing. Uh, we'll talk about Spark a little bit. Uh, Spark is now has an R interface, so that shows in addition to Python, Java, and Scala that the R is something important. I want to talk a little bit about community. If you're in the Salt Lake City area, there's there's a group called Big Data Utah there, and also Utah Geek Events. There are actually a guy named um, Nick and a guy named Pat that run these, Nick Bagley and Pat Wright. You can look at their websites, bigdatautah.org. They have a meetup in January. At, if you know what the IHC is, and again, if you're not from Utah, then just ignore the next 30 seconds or so. But the IHC is the Intermountain Healthcare, the big, huge um, hospital. I guess everybody likes Star Wars analogies. I heard someone call that the Death Star one time because it's just such a huge hospital. And in January, they're going to do a Hadoop install from scratch. You can go look at meetup.com. Uh, they're, they're on meetup.com and also their website. Utah Geek Events just ran the Big Mountain Data Conference, uh, alternatively known as the, the Intermountain Big Data Conference. And we were pretty happy there. We actually won. I was on a team that uh, did this global data competition, and we actually won. And I will mention real quick that uh, hopefully by next week, the, the, the prize was a Pico cluster. It's a little cluster of um, Raspberry Pis, or in my case, it's going to be Orange Pis. And we will show that off. That was our prize. I'm still waiting for delivery. Now, this is a primer, like I said. If you're going to be a data scientist, you look at the tools and the infrastructure out there, and it can really be overwhelming. When I started looking at all the different technologies that you need to just not know in detail, but just to be aware that they exist, there's like about 25 things you need to know about. So we're going to run through those here in this hour. This is going to go for an hour. And you can always come back later and watch this on the video if you get tired of watching it. But I hope, I hope that uh, if anybody has any kind of questions, there is actually a Q&A section open. And you can pop in there and ask questions. But then again, if you're watching this not live, but if you're, if you're not part of the Hangout right now, but you're watching it later on on YouTube, then I'm not going to answer your question. So people think, I think people when, go, when people go through the CS programs at these colleges, they think that it's all about programming. They think being a developer means they're just going to sit around all day and just write code. And I think in the working world, the programmers I've seen, they get they get a little bothered when they have to go to a meeting or especially when they have to communicate with people. It's a, it's kind of a funny thing. At the, at the last university I was at, they made us take extra communications courses in the CS computer science department. Well, if you know anything about Java or you know anything about standard programming, for development, there's actually a lot of tools you need to know. It's not just about writing code, it's about building code. It's about building a product that you can ship, about testing it. So if you, if you, and I'm just making an analogy here. If you know anything about Java, then you know that something called Maven exists. You know about Gradle. Um, those are build systems. Those, those go beyond Ant and, and help you uh, tie together different components of software and do what's called dependency management. If you don't know what dependency management is, you should write that down as a note and go look it up on Wikipedia sometime. Uh, dependency management is is the thing that's going to stick you the most when you're trying to develop code. Uh, if you can't build your code because some dependency is not available, you can spend a lot of time trying to track those kind of problems down. You, you don't just want to write your code. Well, some people do. You see people on Macs, they write their code just on, uh, on Sublime Text. And uh, maybe someday I'll be so awesome that I'm just going to use Emacs. Um, I, I like Emacs quite a bit, or Sublime Text. But for now, I like the IDEs, uh, Integrated Development Environments. They're really pretty cool for their debugging capabilities. You can run a program and stop it in the middle and then see what variable values are. You can step through line by line. Uh, we're going to look at, uh, we'll look at um, Eclipse and a Python program a little bit later here. So maybe I'll show you a little bit of debugging in there. But the point is, and Android Studio is another one people may be familiar with. Um, Android Studio used to be based on Eclipse, and it, they've actually moved it over to a product called IntelliJ. So Eclipse and IntelliJ IDEA are are typically thought of as Java development tools, but they really range around quite a bit. 
and, and again, and the, the point is there's all these other tools, and I'm going to show you in the world of data science that there's a lot of tools you need to know as well. Um, just to kind of wrap up, if you look at that last line, it just gets, it gets bewildering, the almost alphabet soup of things you need to know to get into any particular development effort. And I just realized that my footer says Open West Machine Learning Primer, so sorry about that. <laughs> Forgot to fix that up. Now, let me take a sip of coffee while the slide. We want to talk about the cloud. The, at its core, a cloud is just a computer somewhere else. It's, people think the cloud is this big mystical thing. It, it, it's the real advantage is that companies like Amazon have built have built huge clusters and huge you know quote unquote server farms, so that you can actually deploy an application. Let's say you have a website, and most of the time it's not going to get a lot of traffic. But one day you think you're going to hit the news and make the national news on some you know, product release and you need to be ready to scale up and scale back down. You don't want to hire an entire team of IT people, so you just need this for one day. So you, you deploy your, your applications on, on the cloud, whether it's Amazon or Azure with Microsoft or other options. There's a, a Google has a, um, a machine learning specific cloud product, Google Cloud Platform. You can, you can build your own um, cluster uh, inside your, your organization and manage it with something called OpenStack. There's a lot of different options. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to actually pop out for a second and just show you. Let's let me go screen share my my browser real quick here. Where did my browser go? There it is. Let's go take a look at um, aws.amazon.com. I think I've killed this one account. So let's see if they're going to let me log in with a different account here. I had an account under my own. You have to be careful. They have something called free tier, and if you sign up for the free tier, you you will. Uh, let's see. Now I'm presenting to everyone. Yeah. If you sign up for the free tier, you'll find out that they have a lot of different ways to to nickel and dime you. You you you'll get an instance running and you'll forget. In my case, I had two instances running and I forgot that I had two instances running. And so the first one is typically free. You get 750 hours. Let me show you this real quick here. And then I'm going to explain why we're looking at this. Amazon free uh, tier, AWS. And if you look, uh, you can actually get a year of their service. It only gives you what's called micro instances. So you want to go to this page and you want to look at what's available here. 750 hours per month of Linux. Um, do they give you Windows? I don't think they give you a Windows instance, but who would want that anyways? Um, oh yeah, there it is right there. 750 hours per month of a Windows instance. You can get uh, some storage. You can get some 25 gigs of storage in a, in a DynamoDB, which is a, a NoSQL database that we'll talk about later. The, this is all pretty cool stuff to be able to play around and understand. So I would recommend everybody go and sign up. Let me switch back to this other window here, and we'll look around for a minute. But I recommend that everybody goes and signs up. Now I haven't actually done anything with this um, this login. I've, I've got this particular login. Uh, I, I set up this resource group called Spark Cluster. If you look here, I'm going to click at EC on EC2. Just going to spend a minute on this because this is something that everybody should really have if they're going to be involved in data science. You should understand the cloud and understand how to spin up instances on a on a cloud server. Basically. I have no running instances, right? So if I launch an instance, it's going to come through here and it's going to ask me, uh, well, which kind of instance would you want? Now, you can you can make your own image. I don't know if they let you do that for free. But they have these images that are pre-made. I thought Amazon had a data science-specific image. Uh, I'm not seeing it here, but I think it exists. But if you look up here, here's Amazon Linux. It has Python, Ruby, Perl, Java. Uh, there's Red Hat, Suzy, Ubuntu. A lot of people I like Ubuntu. Uh, you can, for example, go in here and you can deploy what's called a LAMP stack. You can you know, set up a web server and have this available anywhere in the world. And for a little bit of extra money, you can actually get a fixed IP and then tie that to a domain name. So I just wanted to just give you the most basic introduction here. Let me look and see what I did with this resource group. I don't think there's much in here. I'm basically, I'll tell you about my job a little bit later, but I'm building a, uh, we're, we're, we're moving a product to a bigger Spark cluster, and I was going to try to deploy this on the cloud, and Spark is for distributed programming and distributed computing. We'll get to that. All right, well, let's, 
I just wanted to show you that this exists and give you an incentive to go look at it for yourself. I'm staring off, like I said, the camera's supposed to be up there, so I'm staring off here, but the camera up there really doesn't work with Linux. So um, if you don't know about Linux, you should. It's, uh, it's where everything is at. If you're going to be a data science person, you have to know Linux. You'll only get by with Windows for so long, but there's a lot of stuff that, uh, a lot of stuff that, is going to involve knowing about Linux, knowing about the command line. So let's take a look here. Um, we have large data sets. I mean, what's the reason for clouds and clusters is because you may have a data set that you're working with. It's called big data for a reason. And so you'll have a data set that's too big to put on one computer. So you get what's called a cluster. And I, I like this third line in the slides. If you look at this cluster of unreliable commodity hardware, there's a, there's a database out there called CouchDB. And that, that's what COUCH stands for, a cluster of unreliable commodity hardware. It's, um, it's not like the old days anymore. In the old days, I remember in the 1990s, I worked for a software developer out there in, in California, and they, we had this big Sun Microsystems server called Maytag, and the thing was huge. I mean, literally the size of a, a washing machine, so that's why it had the name Maytag. And it was a single point of failure. It, it could do an awful lot of work and run all these databases, but if it went down, everybody was in trouble. Well, we don't do it that way anymore. Now you have a cluster of a bunch of cheap PCs, and you have products, which, again, we'll talk about as we go through this, uh, MapReduce, Spark. You have all the Hadoop. You know, you have all these different products that are designed to run in a cluster and designed to be resilient um, and have, have redundancy and fallback so that if, if one node goes down, it can recover. Now, the downside of that is if you store, let's say, 3 gigabytes of data in Hadoop, then it's going to actually take up about 10 gigabytes because of this redundancy. But that's a good thing. I mean, disk space is cheap and failures are expensive. So you'd rather spend more money now for disk space and memory than lose all your customers due to a failure. Hadoop is a... Um, there's all these funny names for these, these Apache open source. Um, I forget where Hadoop came, comes from off the top of my head, if it's from Berkeley or if it's from Google, but somebody developed this way of spreading a file system across a number of servers and making it resilient, redundant. And it, it runs a file system called HDFS. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's also an associated uh, database, non-relational database called HBase. But really, Hadoop is something that you should install sometime and just spin it up and, and take a look at it. Um, MapReduce, let me just explain briefly. I'm going to go to the next slide, but I'm going to explain briefly that when people say Hadoop, they tend to mean all these different products. Um, in fact, I think the next slide is actually going to have a listing. Yeah, when people say Hadoop, they tend to mean all these different products. Um, I work with Spark. I'm going to be working with Zookeeper pretty soon. There's something in here called Yarn that's not mentioned. Um, Hadoop, narrowly speaking, is just the file system, just HDFS. It's still alive and well. Um, there's something called MapReduce that goes along with it that's kind of being phased out in favor of other methods. Um, so again, the, the whole point of this talk is just to let you understand that all these things exist out there. I'm not going to talk about everything on this screen, um, but as we go through, we'll cover a few of them. Now, MapReduce specifically, it's part of Hadoop. It's separate from HDFS. It actually works on top of HDFS, or, or you don't need HDFS. You can just use it on any, uh, any kind of an input, or many kinds of in. I shouldn't say any, but many kinds of inputs. Uh, here we go. Well, let's see. They say MapReduce was originally Google, and it's implemented in some products like MongoDB. The idea of MapReduce is it takes, it, it'll take a, it'll take a pro, um, take a process and split it across a number of computers. For example, I'm doing something at work where we're trying to uh, create an array of a million objects and then compare a thousand of those objects to all million of them. And that's just too much work for one computer. That could take days. So these products like MapReduce and then Spark that we'll look at, they, they have job managers. Now here on the screen right now, you're seeing a job manager called Yarn. Um, Spark is... It has its own job manager. Uh, it also can work with Yarn, and also can work with something called Mesos, M-E-S-O-S. But this this slide gives you a good idea. I mean, this is just the graphic from the the um, Apache page about about Yarn. You have a, a resource manager, and then on each node you have these these node managers, 
and they, they take a job and split it across a cluster, and it's a lot faster of doing things in parallel. You know, hyper-threading, like in Java, or multi-threading, I should just say, in Java, it's kind of fooling you, because, yeah, it's taking more advantage of the computer that's in front of you, but it's not really, it's not really doing things a whole lot faster um, than without threading. But when you get into clusters and spread things across a network, this is where you can really... You can do things in parallel, where as the job grows, the time to do the job doesn't grow. And just to tie that back to Amazon, um, AWS, and the cloud services, the, the advantage of those cloud services is that you may have a job that takes a couple hours to execute, and then all of a sudden it turns into a huge job. But you're, you're going to see that as a constant uh, fixed time, because as long as you're willing to pay for it, you can keep on deploying servers on the back end. Now, I don't have it in a slide here, but it's worth mentioning that there's a company out there called Hortonworks. There's several companies that repackage the, the open source products like Hadoop and HDFS, Spark. These are free products. The, these companies that repackage them, most of these companies actually give the products out for free and then try to sell their services. Um, Hortonworks has a neat product that actually lets you set parameters, and it will automatically scale up and scale down a network as you need it if you run your own cluster. Uh, otherwise, you can kind of manually add, add and delete machines as you need them. But there are products out there that let you automatically scale out. Now, Apache Pig, um, it's, I, I love how the programmers have a pretty good sense of humor. It's, it's basically an SQL. It's, it's, uh, it has this language called Pig Latin. I haven't worked with this a whole lot. I'm just vaguely familiar with it, and this is this is where you want to be. Is you want to be vaguely familiar with these different uh, products at least, and then pick one that's going to solve your problem and get extremely familiar with it. Hive is uh, another one that does SQL. Um, it's something that we'll get into a little bit later in the talk. But these these databases that we're looking at for big data. Uh, they tend not to be a relational database like Oracle, but they tend to be what's called a NoSQL database, which is really a misnomer because NoSQL doesn't mean NoSQL. It means not only SQL. These, are, these pig and hive are, are products that layer on top of these non-relational databases and let you issue SQL. Now, we'll get into it more, but yeah, sure. If, you, if you're a bank and you need speed and you need um, what's called ACID transactions, then probably a relational database is still the best option. But there are actually ACID databases, which I have to explain ACID, but there's ACID compliant databases in the NoSQL world. This is my favorite product at the moment. Uh, I'm As a student, I have a little programming job up at, uh, it, well, the University of Utah has this, ho this big hospital system. And I'm up in a, a research facility uh, as that's it's, a, it's an arm of, if you, know, if you know Utah, you know where I'm talking about, but I won't mention it specifically, but it's a, it's a cancer research institute um, that's part of the university hospital system, and I'm on this really neat project where I don't know anything about genetics, really, but I'm, I'm, getting to, I'm getting paid a little bit of money to do something, don't tell my boss, but I do this for free. I'm getting paid to learn a lot more about Java, a lot more about build systems, and specifically a lot more about Apache Spark. So Spark is trying to replace MapReduce. Um, Spark, it, it, and if I, if I, I think in two weeks, if I have time, next week we're going to look at R and Shiny. Uh, we're going to look at maybe IPython, but in two weeks I think I'll do a talk on Spark. So come back in two weeks if you want to see this a lot more in depth. Uh, I may or may not show off a little bit of it today, depending on how time goes. But it, MapReduce did a lot of disk writes. It, it would it would process data, it would write it to disk, and then read it from disk again. Um, Apache Spark gives you a better way. Of, of keeping things in memory. You can, you can chain operations together. And it has something called, a, uh, it has a DAG. Well, there's two things in Spark. One's an RDD, a Resilient Distributed Data Set. So it'll actually let you load up a data set into memory, and it'll, it's resilient, so it's, it's redundant, and it's also spreading it across a cluster. And then there's also something called DAG, Directed Acyclical Graphs. So Spark can figure out from the operations, like the chain of operations that you set, the, the most efficient way to manage that job and get it done without taking up too many resources. It's really a pretty amazing product. As noted in the last of uh, that slide, Spark was the most active project in 2014. I bet it still is. If we look at the components, there's Spark Core, which is really all I'm playing with right now, and then RDDs I mentioned. 
Um, I'm using Java. I'm using a little bit of Scala, but really Java. Um, there is an SQL interface for Spark, which I we don't have a reason to use that, so I haven't played with that. Spark streaming is a really amazing um, amazing aspect of Spark that I haven't used yet either. It's for, for example, if you want to watch all the Twitter feeds and you have a constant stream of data coming in, you don't have a, a fixed data set. You have a, a real-time data set coming in, and it's it's really amazing these products and how they can how they can process real-time data and do data analysis and come up with, for example, for Twitter, the big thing is sentiment. You're, let's say you're a political candidate. You want to watch every tweet about your candidate on Twitter. You bring it in and use some machine learning to decide are the tweets you know, positive, are they negative. You, you can make different decisions about the data you're seeing. Uh, the machine learning library, there's, there's a couple of libraries built into Spark. Uh, and then one of the coolest things is called GraphX. Um, there's... They figured out that the GPUs, graphic processing units, which are like the CPUs on video cards, they figured out that those are actually much more, well, they didn't figure it out. They knew all along. But, but the truth is that a, a GPU, a video card processor, is much more designed for the kind of things that a lot of data processing does in terms of matrix manipulation. So if you're doing just general sequential processing, then your regular CPU is good. But if you're if you're going to actually be uh, doing a lot of ro rotations, translations, data manipulation, especially graphics, and, and a lot of a lot of data science is representing data graphically, and I don't just mean visualization; I even mean the internal way of, of representing it as a as a matrix, and then being able to do um, operations on that matrix. So you're you're finding in a lot of clusters and a lot of a lot of different data science environments, you're finding that. A lot of the nodes are making GPUs available for processing, which is really pretty cool. Now, um, Mahout, I don't know if you say Mahout or Mahout. Um, this is a, um, it's, it's a machine learning product. Uh, it's a machine learning library that goes on top of a lot of the other Apache products. I haven't uh, used it a whole lot. Um, I just thought the logo was pretty cool up there. So it's something to look into. You, you, I want to bring your attention, though. I mean, I, I put a lot of text on this slide. You know, the idea is that you may want to download these slides later or pause your screen if you're watching this later and read this more carefully. But look at that last item. You know, we are building our future implementations on top of a DSL, a domain-specific language. When you, I'm pretty new as a as a programmer. I mean, I've done programming type things for a long time, but as far as really being in the developer mode, I'm pretty new at it in just the last year or so. And I'm coming to find that you don't just learn one language. You learn a bunch of languages. There's there's a lot of value in knowing one language very well, like Java has a, a lot of depth to it. And so it's Python, to a large extent, has a lot of depth to it as well. Um, it, it's worth knowing that, but then it's also going to give you skills to pick up little other languages. You'll find I mentioned products like Gradle. Uh, I mentioned Maven. Well, Gradle especially um, has its own DSL. It's, it's based on Scala. You'll find all kinds of products that have their own own specific language for accomplishing things. And so the, the, the better you get at picking up new languages, the better you're going to adapt to these different products. Now, now we're getting to, I think, a really interesting part of this talk. Um, R, R is a programming language. It, when I first started doing R, I didn't know much about statistics. The last statistics class that I took was a long time ago. Uh, I'm, I'm almost 50 years old. I'm 48. And the last stats class I took was in like 1989 or something like that. And it was just intro to stats. I didn't like it very much. I thought, oh, this isn't real math. This is just uh, situational. It, you look at the situation and, oh, if it looks like this, put it in this equation. And if it looks like that, put it in this equation. I think to a large extent that is what statistics is on, on the basic levels. I think when you get really advanced, you start to see the underlying um, theory. But for the most part, it's just a bunch of different methods. And so I would look at R, and I would get really confused because uh, I, I, I just didn't understand a lot of what I was seeing. Well, R, it's a programming language. It's a little funky. If you're from an object-oriented background, you'll think R is a little funky. Uh, I do. But it's really powerful. But the, the more interesting part is the more... I'm, I just took another statistics, statistics class this fall, uh, which I hope I passed. <laughs> I think I passed, and it was pretty tough. I'll just say real quick that the whole class was basically there doing the final for the whole two hours. I was very surprised. But statistics is is what R is all about. So the more you know about statistics, the more R is going to make sense to you. 
Uh, I would really, I'm going to mention a few things in this, in this, um, the course of this talk that you really need to look at this. And I would really recommend that you look at this um, R series on Coursera called the Data Science Track. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's good to be able to at least say you know some basics about R if you're going to be in the, in the machine learning or in the data science space. And again, I, I mentioned that um, I can't get RStudio to display properly. I even have, I'm even logged in here with a different account from a different computer, and when I show R on that screen, it's just grayed out. I don't know why, so I apologize for that uh, little detail. But we, at the end of this talk, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, but at the end, uh, as we get close to an hour, I'm going to wrap up the talk. Uh, but for anyone that wants to stick around, I'm, I'm just going to go bushwhack a little bit and, and try to install uh, our studio server on my Linux machine. I'm running a Linux machine. That's what you're looking at here. And I'm going to try to install it there so we can look at it through a web interface, maybe play around a little bit. OK, so you have something called uh, CRAN R Studio. Um, this is part of the power of R is uh, all these people have written all these packages. It's an open source product, so it means anyone can contribute. Many, many, many very talented people, especially when they're in the process of writing a research paper, have to develop their own code to do the analysis they want. And then once they, they find a general purpose for that code, they package it up and they load it up on CRAN, this comprehensive R archive network. Um, you have, so that's the R language. And then on top of that, the IDE, Integrated Development Environment for R, is called RStudio. Uh, we'll try to look at RStudio server a little bit later. And for those people that are partial to Python, you can actually you can sit on either side of the fence and, and use the other side of the fence. In R, there's a Python interface. And then there's a, from Python, there's an R interface. Now, I would say for machine learning, for... I would say in the research and academic environment, R is the big thing. I'd say out there in the corporate environment that uh, Python's really taking over or has taken over. Having said that, you know, Google has their, if you, if you want to have some fun, go look at the R um, style guide for Google. And you'll, you can figure out that a lot of people at Google are using R. Uh, Weka is, I don't know why they still teach with Weka. Um, it's, it's good for teaching. We use this in my, my CS4620 class with his, uh, Professor Sonati. He's a really great guy that I did, he did this research paper with him and his wife, and we got to go to Seattle and present it in June. That was pretty awesome. Um, and Weka, Weka, I think the reason that Weka is still around is because it's in Java. It's hard, to, it's hard to find data science type people that are Java type people. It seems like it's two different kinds of people for the most part. And then it's, uh, it's very, I was going to say old, but no, let's see, it's mature. That's the word for it. Uh, like I say in the third point here, extremely well-developed library of machine learning algorithms. So that's all I'm going to say about Weka. I wouldn't really spend any time with it, but if you take a class on data mining that's kind of old school, they'll probably use Weka. Now, talking about IDEs, uh, let's, let's talk about Python a little bit here, um, and also about Java. The idle, idle for Python, if you install Python, you can just have this command line. It's called a REPL. Let me actually bring up an instance of it here. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can make this work on the fly. I wasn't planning on doing this, so that's the dangerous thing to do, right? Let's bring up a terminal. Um, yes, it has ugly. Um, can you guys see that? Let me look at something here. You know, I'm going to take take just a one minute break here to do something technical. So uh, I just found out I'm not getting my Pico cluster today. Oops. Yeah, I'm 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 just doing something technical here for a minute. So you can go ahead. I'm trying to just check another computer and see if you can actually see that terminal window. I know you've been able to see my slides and me, but for some reason, I think next week I'll do this in Windows. Um, you have 30 more seconds to grab your coffee. Um, yeah, I think next week I'm going to do this in Windows because I'm just finding too many little bugs with Linux and Google Hangouts. Like, yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm just actually logging in on another machine just to get a fresh look here. What is going on here? Oh, here we go. Be with you in just a minute. I've got about 10 more seconds here, right? I'm just, I don't know why it's making me jump through all these hoops here. Well, I'm assuming you probably can't see that terminal window. 
which is kind of a bummer because, man, Google Hangouts is really a pain. It's making me answer all these permissions on this other machine. Got to be an easier way to do these things. <laughs> um, yes, I know I'm about to join a Hangout on air. Okay. Um, yeah, that does not... I'm not really seeing that um, terminal window very well at all. So I guess I'm not going to do stuff in terminal. Well, yeah, okay, there we are. Sorry, you can see this, right? So, okay. What I wanted to show is idle. So um, when you're in Linux, here's a command line. Um, there's a command in Linux called which. I'm trying to, the, the point is, I'm trying to show you what a REPL is. It's a, um, I'll have to look up what REPL means, I'm forgetting. It's a read, evaluate, print loop. It's basically, let me see if I have this set up. Hey, I have it set up. What do you know? Um, it actually popped up a different window. OK, that I think you can see better. Yeah, cool. So basically, you know, now we're in Python. Um, you know, you can say print. Uh, I mean, it has all the typical stuff. Let's see, this is Python 2.7, so everybody does this, right? Um, I don't think version does anything. Yeah, it does. Oh, no, it doesn't. Okay. Um, so, you know, you can say x, you know, equals 3, and then say x, and it tells you 3. Um, what all I'm trying to show you is that the, the, the value of R in Python is that you have these interactive environments. Scala has this, too. You can actually, you don't have to write a whole program and then try to build it and fix bugs. You can just test things out on the fly. It, it allows for a much uh, faster development process. Um, just wanted to show you what idle looks like real quick. I'm going to quit that. And then let's come back over here to terminal. Um, now there's something called uh, Eclipse. Actually, let's go, let's go take a look at Eclipse real quick. You know, since I'm talking about Python and Eclipse, um, let me go to the slides. Uh, I mentioned about Android Studio before is now based on IntelliJ, so we probably won't look at IntelliJ today. Let me mention real quick that IntelliJ has a, um, a student deal. Uh, I just signed up yesterday. If you have a, a university email address, then you can actually uh, get free access to all the all the IntelliJ products. I was using I'm learning Ruby right now, so I was using RubyMine. Now, as I have a lot of people telling me that uh, real data mining uses Python, um, we're going to look at, let's take a look here in Eclipse. Let's look at some of these web scraping things. There's a, um, there's another set of Coursera courses. I really like Coursera when I have time for it. A lot of times I don't have time. But the thing about um, Coursera, okay, here's Eclipse. The thing about Coursera is they have a, a series of Python classes. If you're not very sophisticated, it's a semi-difficult. It'll take you through web scraping and take you through some other projects. But if you if you have some uh, if you have some sophistication, you can actually do these classes like in one day. Uh, let me see. Databases. This is not what we're looking for. Um, I'm actually not seeing the project I'm looking for here. Let me see here. This is one of those one of those moments where uh, I should have had this up ahead of time, and I apologize. But I'm just going to take the 30 seconds or so, hopefully, to find this Python project. Which oh, it's in repo. That's right. Okay, um, that's nice. Okay, let's just go ahead and open it then. Open file. Um, it's going to be on Dropbox. It's going to be in Workspace, 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 Repo. Basically, what you're looking at is in Eclipse, you have a workspace. Um, I think there's a bit of a debate. I, I appreciate some comments on this. There's a bit of a debate. I, I actually put some of my I put some of my stuff in the workspace. But it seems like people don't like. Um, my boss really hates the idea of putting code in the workspace, and it makes sense if your code's checked into a project with with um, you know version management or Git, then you probably don't want it in your in your Eclipse workspace. Um, let's take a look here. Here we go. Python data structures. Python web scrape. Found it. Let's go take a look at one of these Python files. Um, 
chapter 12, week 4, XML Pi. Let's see this one here. I think this is the one. And this, if this is the first time you're looking at Python, then it's a pretty cool. Uh, it's a pretty cool language. It has a lot of different capabilities. It has, like R, it has a lot of libraries that you can pull in. Um, I'm going to try to actually open up the project here. Open new, open file, open. Well, let's see. Let me just try a different file here and find something that's going to be a little more interesting to look at. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, this is one, uh, and this this relates to the slides we were just looking at. Uh, let me go back to the slides just for a second and talk, and then, and again, I apologize for not having that set up in advance, but uh, hey, this is my first Hangout. So if you look, there's these things called web crawlers. Uh, there's something in Python called Scrapey, um, and then if you know anything about HTML, they're called HTML tags. So Tag Soup is is another product. Beautiful Soup uh, is another product based similar to Tag Soup. It's just Python instead of Java. the The reason for these um, web scrapers, you know, if you know anything about web development, you know that HTML is not a settled thing. Um, they've tried over time to make it more strict. They've tried to enforce um, syntax, and it just doesn't work. Uh, a browser uh, really needs to be able to, it really needs to be able to um, handle mal what's called malformed HTML. It needs to handle bugs and still present a good web page. And so you can't, you can't really dependably, unless you wanted to write an entire library from scratch, you can't dependably analyze web pages in Python uh, without hitting some snags. And so th these products do a really great job of representing the, the DOM, the document object model is what, what it's called underneath a, a web page. It's sort of a, a tree structure. And in this uh, in this uh, Coursera databases, not databases, Coursera web scraping class, let's go back to Eclipse for a second here. Um, hello, where did Eclipse go? Um, did I close it? I don't think I did. Is that it? There it is. Cool. So you notice here we in a Python program, and you should be able to see that. Let me see. Yeah, I mean, if you just blow this up to be your whole screen, then you should be able to see this. You see this one line here from BS4, import beautiful soup. There's actually a version 3 and a version 4. Um, I, use, I like to use version 4. It's, it's designed to work with Python 2.7 and up. Um, I should mention real quick, because I don't think I have it in the slides, that there's a big thing in the Python world about um, 2.7 versus version 3 and up. Uh, version 3 is not 100% backward compatible, so a lot of people have not gone over to version 3 yet. They are still using um, version 2.7. So you'll, you'll just find that's a big thing out there as to which libraries are compatible with which version of Python. But let's take a look at what this program actually does. We import this library here. And then I, I have this commented out. Um, there's on this class you have like test runs and then you have final runs. And so for the for the testing, he gives us this URL. This guy Dr. Chuck teaches the class. He's a pretty entertaining character. Um, you have what what we're going to do is we're going to look at a series of web pages. We're going to read down to the 18th link and follow that link through, and then we're going to do that seven times. And this is just an assignment from this Python web scraping class. I think I, because I have a programming background, I was able to bang this class out in a day, basically, or a couple, of, a few hours. And if you're, like I say, if you're not as sophisticated of a programmer, and I'm not that sophisticated, but if you're not, uh, if you're a beginning programmer, this Python for Everybody series, which when I'm done here, I'll bring it up on a web browser and show you. This would be a great thing to take. Uh, we have to set up some variables here. Next URL, it's basically setting the next place we're going to look at. We're tracking the last names that are found. That's that's what's uh, that's what's in these links is the last name of somebody. And we're supposed to, the assignment was to give the last name of the seventh person, you know, the seventh time you iterate through this. So speaking of iterating, here's how you do that in Python. It's a it's a there's there's a little more beautiful ways to do iteration in Python. I guess because I come from C++ and Java, I t still tend to like for something in you know four loops but this is this is more python esque when you say for iter number 
in the range of how many iterations. Ra range is just going to take, we, you know, we set how many iterations to seven, so range is just going to make, um, you know, zero to six, and then iter number is going to loop through, and every time it's going to be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. You'll see we have this HTML read variable I set up, and this is where we call our library. Um, if you look back up here, we have URL live. We imported URL live. And now we're referring to this import. We're, this isn't exactly how you would do it in Java or probably even Python. You could assign it more to a local variable. But here, we're just directly referencing the library. We're using this function called URL open. I'm telling it to open the next URL and read it into this variable HTML read. Uh, then you, you know, it might be more interesting if I just step through this. Let me just check something and see something first. No, don't run this. I'm, uh, you're going to get to see a little bit of Eclipse here. I'm going to actually step through this in a debugger and show you how this works rather than try to explain it. Um, so I think I have to make a new project based on this. So I'm going to say new other. Um, I have something installed called PyDev in Eclipse. If you look up here in the upper right, you see the little perspective for PyDev. Um, so I'm going to make a new PyDev project. In fact, you know, I want to give you a complete thing here. I think people are interested in Python, so let's take a look real quick. If you look in Eclipse and you go to your help menu, you're probably asking yourself, well, I hope you can figure out how to get Eclipse. But once you have Eclipse, you're asking yourself, how do I get PyDev? You go to Eclipse Marketplace. And then over here, uh, you know, it's... Sorry, I need to actually share this particular window. Let's share the Eclipse. Okay, this is Eclipse Marketplace. This is just a window that popped up when I selected it. Um, if you come in here and you type Python, it'll show you all the different plugins. Uh, Eclipse is an open source uh, IDE, and it's very popular, especially with Java people, but it has a lot of other capabilities. Uh, I'm actually switching over to the IntelliJ products right now, but you'll see right now the first thing that pops up here is PyDev. You'll notice it's already installed. Um, 463,000 installs. When, when you install something in Eclipse, pay attention to that number. If only like a thousand people have installed it and it's something that you think is general purpose, you might want to stay away from it. You also want to look at the last updated dates and, and who's developing it. Um, but PyDev is a very well-known uh, plugin for Eclipse. So that's where, and the reason I showed you that, let me go back and share Eclipse again. Uh, there we go. The reason I showed you that is because when I when I come in here and I say new project, I'm going to go new, and you, if you say on yours you don't have PyDev, you can get it by installing PyDev, like I just showed you. Let's make a PyDev project. Oops. Um, project name is going to be Hangout. Um, let's see, let's not use the default. Let's go look for this directory here. Well, you know what I'll do? I'll show you the right way to do things, actually. Let's use the default directory in the workspace for the project files. Notice we're using Python 2.7. I'm going to leave the interpreter to be default. I'm going to finish. And that's just a bug that I have right now. Okay, and it says, this is a very Eclipsian. This kind of project is associated with the PyDev perspective. Oh, I just realized you can't see these little windows on the Hangout. That's a bummer. Um, well, now you can see that I've created this. And you'll notice that there's really no code in there, right? There's, there's, so we need to add some code. So let me actually uh, come in here and right-click. Oops, right click on the project itself and say new file, uh, new source folder. And, oh, sorry. Let me say, boy, you can't even see these menus on the Hangout. This is really buggy with, I think this is a Linux thing. I apologize. Um, let me just set this up then. I thought you guys were seeing all this and uh, you're not. So I'm going to. Um, say new file. Um, I'm going to share that window. Oh, man, this is just bogus. So I have to go share every last little window. <laughs> um, here we go. Here's the new file dialog. Um, you'll notice that it's asking for a file name. I'm going to give it advanced. 
And then, come on. Why is this not working? Okay, I'm going to say advanced, and I'm going to say link to file in the file system. I'm going to browse, um, go look down at my Dropbox and um, workspace, repo, uh, Python, data, web scrape, and I'm going to use this directory. So this is going to actually bring in, uh, you can see it's going to bring in, I have to go back and share um, the Eclipse window again. You'll see now it's going to have, where is it here? Um, why am I not seeing all my files? Well, this is the, the danger of trying to do things on the fly. Um, user bin. Huh. That's, that's strange. Okay, well, Let's see if we can run a debugger on this here. I'm going to run debug. I have to do what's called setting up a debug configuration. Oh, you can't even see the menus, man. Let me share this window. If you're still watching this, I hope you really like Python and debugging and Eclipse because you're probably going to sleep if you're not really interested in Python. But Python is, you know, when I say overview of data mining, it's this is one of the important tools. So I have to set up this configuration. I'm going to go here to Python run. Um, Hangout is the project. Apply. And let's see if that fixed it up. Well. Bear with me for just a minute here. I'm just trying to get this so I can show you the debugging on this. Otherwise, I'm just going to walk you through this file. Um, workspace, um, Python, repo, Python, web scrape. OK. You know, I just want to really take a little bit of time to get this set up here. So I'm going to give you two minutes here. Um, let me put, throw the slides back up, and let me have you go. If you need a little break, I'm going to actually go, I think, significantly longer than an hour with this. Um, right now we're trying to set up something so I can show you, actually run through the debugging of this. I'll be back in about a minute or two. We'll put some music on for you in the meanwhile. Almost there. 
Come back in 30 seconds. Okay, I am back here. So I'm going to bring up, uh, I have the debugger working on this now. I just wanted to show you this because it's really pretty cool. So here we are. Here's Eclipse. Um, you'll notice, let me go back to the PyDev. These, these things in the upper right are called perspectives. And so you have Java, Java EE. Um, there's a Git perspective for browsing um, version control, what are called repositories, Scala, Ruby. Um, this will change depending on what you install. I have PyDev, and so I've actually got this program uh, up and in a debugger now. Um, I'm going to switch to the debug perspective, and you notice what popped up here. You have variables. So what we do in a debugger, and I did get requests from people to dig more into Python, so hopefully that's what you want. I'm going to do this for about five minutes, and then we're going to move through the rest of the slides and then wrap up, and then for those that want to stick around, we'll do the... Uh, RStudio server installation. So I can try to show you RStudio. Just to reiterate what I've said like at the beginning and about halfway through is uh, for some reason I'm running Hangouts in Linux and Linux and Hangouts aren't getting along. And so I, I don't know why RStudio, or probably RStudio more, but RStudio won't show up on a screen share. So I'm going to try to install the web-based version. But right now we're going to look at this program that does web scraping in Python. Um, I'm running a debugger to step through it. One of the neat things about a debugger is that you can set what are called breakpoints. Um, let's set a breakpoint. I, I walked you through the opening of this program to kind of show you the setup. Um, we got to this, this loop here. Um, let us go and put a... Uh, oh, let's see. This is a different file, actually, but that's okay. This is a pretty cool one. Let's make sure it runs first. <laughs> and I have to still set up a run configuration. I have a debug configuration set up, but not a run config. Here we go. Okay, run config, hang out, blah, 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 run. Okay, and you notice down at the bottom, you see how what it's doing, this is what I explained before, is it's going through and it's searching these pages and then at the end, on iteration 7, it finds the last name is Gustav. Let's take a look at how the program actually does that. Now, if you just debug a program that doesn't have any breakpoints, it'll just run through normally. So I'm going to set my debugger. Let's set it right here. If you look, I'm going to add a breakpoint. Uh, in the debugger view, you can actually look and see where your breakpoints are. You can manage them. You can remove them, disable. And what the breakpoint is is when I actually run the debug, which is this little bug uh, if you see this little bug up here, um, the little bug has a menu associated with it. Um, you can go to debug configurations. I don't think you're going to be able yeah, that's weird that in Linux Eclipse is every window is a separate app. Anyways, I'm starting the debugger. And you notice it's it's run through and it stopped at this line. And if you look in the upper left hand here, you can see all the different, um, there's the main thread perspective, there's the module that it's in. Um, and then if you look here on the upper right, there's something called variables. This is very useful for debugging. Um, let's take a look at the main thread. And what happened there? Come on, show me some variables here. Okay, here we go. Um, if you look, here's the, if you click on the actual program and then the main thread, huh, I don't know why these variables aren't coming up here. I was having trouble with the debugger in Eclipse yesterday in Ruby and I actually switched over to um, IntelliJ's Ruby. Well, globals. Um, Oh, here we go. So you can actually see the class if you look in the upper right here. Yeah, we've created this class called Beautiful Soup, and you can see 
here's next URL, next URL, you can see all the variables. So if you run into, and here's local variables down here, um, URL live, uh, URL next URL. So it's very useful for debugging. And then you just basically click, you can use the keys, or if you look up here on the top, there's uh, step into, step over, and step return. I'm going to step into, let's close that. And we're going to just step through this here. And if you look, HTML read, it's about to read in the whole HTML file. So let's actually do that. Let's go to the next step. And then it's going to, it's going to apply the beautiful soup library to HTML read and put it in a variable named soup. So let's step through that. Okay. So now if we look over here in our, I'm going to make this take up the whole window for a minute. If we look in our variables, um, there's beautiful soup, the class right there. Here's soup. And there, if you look down at the bottom, let me make that a little bigger. In that soup variable, there's the actual HTML file, but it's 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 done it in a way that's a lot easier for a program to read. Um, let's see, where's the H? There's HTML red. Um, you know, without looking at the differences between these two versions on the surface, it doesn't look a whole lot different. But the uh, the soup is going to actually set it up as a tree structure and let you use different functions to step through it. Let's go ahead and step through more of this program. Uh, we're inc incrementing a link number. Uh, we're basically saying, are we, are we at the end? I'm saying here is this link number that we're on the one that we're trying to find um, and not yet. So let's step through. It's, it's basically stepping through all the links on the page until it finds the one that we want. And you can just basically see what's going on here. It's, if it's until it satisfies that if statement, it's not going to drop into that loop. And it's 18 times, so let's go look up what link number is. In the debugger and the variables over here. I don't know why it's not cooperating, so I'm just going to keep stepping through until we drop into this loop. And still stepping in. Okay, so now we're in. We're back. We basically found our first tag, and we're looking through the next tag. Um, let me actually continue this. And show you the console a little better. And you can see that it's it's stepping through all these pages. I'm going to keep running here. And I'd say that the, the part to really look at in this program, it basically says it goes through a certain number of iterations. It says that we found this last name. It puts it in this array. And it, it basically tells it, tells it what the next tag to get is. This is part of soup, is get the next link. And so this is just really a great way. Um, hopefully this has given you some kind of an overview of Eclipse and Python and debugging. Uh, I'm... I should do a, a whole hangout where I'm a little better prepared and have this all set up. But I hope that this uh, shows you enough to get you excited about installing Eclipse and playing with Python. Let's run through the rest of this talk. I'm going to get back to the slides here. Um, Python has something called IPython Notebook. So if you want to show your code off to the world, let me show you in a browser. Uh, it is... I believe I have an iPython notebook examples up here. 
that's our cluster. Here we go. So I don't know why this guy chose to do this on GitHub, but not IPython Notebook. But here's a gallery of interesting IPython Notebooks. This actually lets you, um, and, and next week we're going to look at R and Shiny, which is the, the R version of IPython. Um, and IPython, just for note, is, is actually called Jupyter now. Um, let's look at a, I don't know, let's look at a, something with R. Oh, here, let's look here. SciPy, this is a good one here. Let's look at general social data, um, gun violence, automated processing of news media, and generation of associated imagery. So what's happening is that you can... I thought the word imagery meant that they have... Here we go, there's some images. <laughs> They're helpful. I thought this would be some more about, and some more about graphs. Bioinformatic approaches to computation of poetic meter. Yeah, there we go. But what this is letting you do is it's letting you show your code. Uh, some versions of IPython would let you actually go in here and change the code on the fly. And then it's making this visual. This is what I was looking for, is that you can, you can do some really great visualizations. And you can let other data scientists see the method that you're using and your results right there. Uh, you, if you make the data set available, then they can, they can recreate your experiments. And you see here the proper name of Jupiter. Even though it's ipython.org at the top, it's Jupiter. They separated ipython from Jupiter because people started using it for a lot of different things than just Python. So that's a great way to display your work to other people. Um, and again, with, with R, there's a way to do that. We'll look at that more in depth next week. Let's go back to the slides. Now, I'm just going to run through this pretty quickly. Um, I'm over time, but I want to want to finish this up. And the beauty of YouTube is that you can always come back and check it out later. There's these libraries for Python. NumPy and SciPy are pretty important libraries. They let you do a lot of mathematical functions. Scikit-learn is machine learning. This uh, is a slide worth reading, but I'm not going to take the time to go through it all. But Pandas is a really great library for Python and big data. Um, machine learning is a, a really fascinating subject. It's a subset of data mining and artificial intelligence. Uh, it, there's a lot of different uses for it. You can see my, my favorite story is about Netflix running their million-dollar contest to improve their, their recommendations. They, they actually selected a winner and awarded the prize but didn't use their work. Um, I'm not sure why. I think there's a good, probably there's speculation on this, but I think it's because they don't want their, uh, their all the contest submissions were open, open source. They had to be avail, you know, available for everyone to see, and I don't think Netflix wants to use an openly available recommendations engine because then any, anyone else can use it too. Basically, there's different approaches to machine learning. Machine learning, you know, the whole point is to take a big data set and to draw conclusions from the data that you wouldn't be able to see just by looking at it as a human being. Um, there's a lot of, it doesn't take much data to overwhelm a human, but a computer can handle it a lot better. These different approaches to machine learning supervise, where you're given a test data set and you're, you're actually matching it. Um, you, you're, you're basically told how to handle the data and then apply that, that mapping to new data that comes along. Uh, the, the, the bottom line of that is that you have a preconceived notion of the structure of the data you're looking at. Unsupervised, I think, is a lot more interesting in my, from my perspective, where you're you're letting the computer find structure to data. There's other approaches, classification and clustering and regression. Regression is a pretty standard statistics technique. Common algorithms in machine learning. These are things that if you're going to get into machine learning, you should have an idea of what these do. Uh, that could be a talk in the future where I, I do a specific talk about machine learning. Some of the applications, uh, natural language processing. It's kind of funny, when I, when I first heard NLP, natural language processing, I assumed it was just for speech, but it's actually for any writing or speech. You, you'd be shocked at what a complicated task natural language processing is. There's a professor up at U of U who his example is you, you ask a question of a computer like how long has Obama been in office or how long has he been president and I, I don't fully understand his point but he says the computer really can't answer that. It's really difficult for a computer to figure out what you're asking. Something that sounds very simple to a human because of context and, and multiple meanings of words can be very complicated. So there's a whole science of natural language processing. All these other uh, all these other fields as well, computer vision, if you ever um, deposit a check um, or if you're trying to 
you know, match images and, and do facial recognition, for example, like with Facebook when you it tags your friends and knows who your friends are. That's an example of machine learning. Search engines are an example of machine learning. They they learn from the searches you do. You'll you'll notice that Google actually provides uh, geographically based search results and and personally tailored search results and results that improve over time. Now I want to talk about NoSQL databases a little bit. Um, there, as I mentioned before, there is SQL available in these NoSQL databases. It really means not only SQL. Uh, a lot of the relational database people poo-poo these databases because they, they don't understand them. They, um, they, they think that um, different aspects of NoSQL databases are really desirable. Their ability to, to distribute data across, uh, across wide geographical regions, the, the ability to have really fast lookups and searches, is what makes companies like Amazon and Overstock be able to work. You, you wouldn't be able to run the front end of Amazon off of uh, a NoSQL database, I mean off of a relational database. Uh, it's just too restrictive. The, the structure of, of a, a relational database has to be known up front. Um, these databases can have a dynamic structure depending on the data that comes in. No, uh, regular relational databases cost a lot of money, and these don't. Uh, even although MySQL is an open source product, so that's a lot of relational people, they claim that the reason for NoSQL is because it's free, but there's plenty of good um, relational free databases as well. But it just basically solves a different problem. A relational database is going to be better at transaction management, although that's changing. But right now, they're going to be better at having, um, you know, if you take your money out at the ATM, they, the bank knows that you've taken the money out. There's it's, there's not like different values in different parts of the system. And with the NoSQL database, you have a concept called consistency. Now you might be just talking a few milliseconds, but there might be a few milliseconds where different parts of the database are out of sync. So you could be shopping on Amazon and think you're going to buy a pair of shoes, but when you go to check out, it's not they're not actually available. And that's really less and less of a problem these days. These are some of the different types of NoSQL databases. Um, I will make these uh, slides available on, on a website. Key values are really basic. Graph type databases are really interesting. Um, a guy did a presentation at the uh, Utah Geek events about graph databases. That's like for Facebook. A, a graph isn't just a chart or a picture like you would think of it. A graph is uh, a mathematical concept of nodes and edges. And so if you think of, of your friends, you know, your friend, each, each one of your friends is a node, you're a node, and then the, the relation, like you know you know, John and Bob, and John knows Bob, but he doesn't know Sally, you know, you can draw edges between the people that know each other and represent uh, a network. And that's, that's how Facebook keeps track of all, all, your, um, all your friends. Mongo, Cassandra, and HBase are, are the better known um, databases. These are Mongo's... Um, I don't hear about it so much as I used to. Cassandra is a really important one, and you can you can use Cassandra with Amazon uh, instances. HBase is the one that's part of Hadoop. I mean, these, these these databases are a lot simpler. They don't need complicated table structures. They can be as simple as a key value, and they they're going to let you do things a lot faster in a lot more straightforward fashion than trying to implement a relational database. But again, relational databases have their place. Well, I'm actually at the end of the slides. Um, I just wanted to reiterate the people here in Salt Lake City, Big Data Utah, Utah Geek Events. Nick and Pat are great guys. Go look at Big Data Utah, um, or I don't have it here, but Utah, yeah, utahgeekevents.com. Um, this slide's a little old um, from my Open West talk. It's the next meetup is actually January. Um, January, I'd have to look it up, but if you go to meetup.com and look up Big Data Utah, you'll find it. I hope to see you there. And now I'm going to go, just wanted to mention one last thing here, Kaggle. Um, Kaggle is pretty cool. It's a, it's a website where you should really get involved if you want to be in data science. We're not doing a deep dive on clustering today, sorry. Um, if you want to be involved in data science, you should go look at Kaggle and sign up for an account there. There's, there's competitions there. Some of those are for money. And if you can do really well in Kaggle, you're going you're gonna to have a good job offer. But there's introductory competitions there, too. So if you want to know more about machine learning, uh, I would really recommend, and especially if you can get a team together, I'd seriously recommend that you go to Kaggle, get an account, and try some of the really basic projects in there. 
Well, I appreciate your being here. Uh, I'm actually going to go, I'm going to switch over now to a different mode. So the official talk is over here. Um, I'm going to go to a different mode now. We're going to try to install our Studio uh, server. So let me get away from sharing these slides. We're done with the slides. So I'm going to close out. I'm using Impress, which is the uh, open office version. Um, let me get some water here real quick. And again, if you're still watching, you're really dedicated because a lot of people, they don't have the attention span it takes to be involved in programming or data science. They tune out, they tune out of anything after about five minutes. Um, let's go take a look at um, the browser I'm going to use here. So RStudio, the, the reason I'm doing this part is because uh, for some reason the RStudio application for Linux doesn't want to work with Google Hangouts. I mean, I can bring it up on my screen, but when I try to share it, it just doesn't work. Um, so I'm going to go RStudio server, and we're going to we're going to look at RStudio here again. RStudio is the IDD, IDE Integrated Development Environment for R. Um, I want to show it to you, and you know, I'm just going to run this a little long. We'll actually do the shiny example real quick. Maybe we'll whet your appetite to come back in a, next week and watch the shiny uh, talk which I would promise to prepare a lot better than I prepared today. This is a, certainly a learning process, especially trying to manage Google Hangouts and talk at the same time. So our Studio server enables you to provide a browser-based interface to a version of R running on a remote Linux server, bringing the power and productivity to blah, blah, blah. Basically, it's going to let you run R. It looks exactly like the RStudio desktop application, but it's in a browser. Um, I'm on Debian slash Ubuntu. If you don't know... If you don't know what these things up here are, you need to know more about Linux. Um, OpenSUSE, CentOS, uh, Ubuntu, um, excuse me, OpenSUSE, I believe is how they say it. People are really kind of particular about the pronunciations. I heard, I've always said GNOME for the desktop, but I heard GNOME, is, and I guess that makes sense because it's GNU. So I have RBase installed already. Um, let me get... Let me just look through here. I haven't actually not done this for a while. So to download and install RStudio server, open a terminal window. Do I really have to do all that? I think I already have this already installed, actually. Let me see. Let me go look at my terminal window. Um, where'd it go? There it is. Yeah, and I know that those are ugly fonts. Um, but I really wanted to, oh, there we go. That makes it a little easier to see what I'm doing, huh? I really wanted you to be able to see this. <laughs> so I think we've got enough space here. And that gives you a little bigger font to look at. Um, which our studio, so I have our studio installed on this machine. Um, but let's see, how do you start? Our, let me see if I've actually got this installed already. Um, you know, I, I work with people that don't like to use Google. I I don't see the point in hacking at something for an hour when, I mean, there's a certain learning process to um, hacking, but there's a certain efficiency to just looking up and not thinking and typing at the same time, our studio server. Um, okay, our studio desk server. Okay, let's just see here. Our, I don't think I have this installed. Let's find out. If I don't have it installed, you're going to get to watch the whole installation process. Oh, I guess I don't have it installed. Okay. Um, or if I do, it's not in my path. So let's go back. Um, if you're not familiar with, with Linux, you don't... Um, where do you go? You don't, um, like, you don't have installers for applications like you would in Windows. You install things on the command line using, in, in Ubuntu and Debian, it's something called apt-get. I don't know what you see. Our studio requires a previous installation of R version 2.11. I have, okay, I'm just going to, oh, you can't see my browser, I apologize. So I'm just looking at a browser window that says, I'm supposed to run this command sudo. It, it means run things as the root. Um, in Linux, if you're just a regular user, um, you don't have all the power to administer everything that's reserved for a user called the root user. That's generally true. There's ways around that. 
So you use sudo. It means do as su. Su means root, and sudo means do do a command as root. Um, app dash get is just the way that Ubuntu and Debian manage um, packages, manage software installation. Um, this is already installed. You're going to see we're going to get a message that it's already installed. It's going to ask for my password here, and it should say, um, "Well, it's too newly installed. What well, was newly installed there?" Um, so when you run something, you should actually look at what it's telling you. One of the skills as a developer that I'm working on is just instead of just looking at that and letting my eyes cross over to actually read. So fallen packages are installed, no longer required. So all this stuff's in here. Um, okay, R base HTML, interesting. I'm not familiar with that one. Um, so it's going to install R base and R base HTML. I'm going to say yes. Let's watch it here. Okay, so that's done. Um, now the next step here, I'm, just re I'm actually reading on a browser window here about how to download this. Um, we want the 64-bit version. So GW Core, I thought I had that already. Sudo, oh, you know, this is actually, yeah, I'm thinking of a different machine. This is good that I'm doing this, gdebi-core. Um, just basically setting it up, unpacking it. Okay, that's done. Um, now, you can download things from a website, but there's, I'm going to show you a pretty cool command. Um, it's called wget. Um, another one's called C, C -URL curl. Um, let me paste this in. wget just goes and gets things from the web. Um, you, this is the download URL for our studio server. Um, I'm on an Intel machine, but I think AMD 64 is going to work. Yeah, because it's just the 64-bit. And I have a 75 megabit per second connection here, so um, since it's almost the end of the year and I hope to see this saying go away, I'm going to say your mileage may vary on that download time. And I hope that next year nobody ever says your mileage may vary again. It's way overused. Okay, so our studio server is downloaded. Um, now we're going to go sudo debi, I mean dw, excuse me. Um, R Studio. Uh, and I don't know if you noticed. If you're not, if you're not a, a Linux person, I don't know if you noticed what I just did. You don't have to type everything. Let me show you something here. I'm in my home directory. I probably shouldn't be working in my home directory, but when when you use um, app dash get to install stuff, it, it doesn't install in the current directory. It installs in a better place, let's say. Um, so uh, you'll notice there's this. Um, the name of this file that we're going to install is long and really would be ugly to type, RStudio server, blah, blah, blah. Um, and there's something called auto-completion in Bash. Uh, Bash is the shell that I'm running. Um, I'm trying to you know, deal with different levels of audience, so if your eyes are glossing over because you already know Linux pretty well, then forgive me for explaining these little things. But um, sudo tw um, and, um, and then RStudio. So if I just type the first letter, it's the only thing in that directory that starts with with an R, and if I hit the tab key, it actually auto-completes for me, which is really cool. So we're installing this right now. Let me go just read ahead here while this is installing. Yes, I would actually like to install the package. It's nice of you to ask. So I wonder if this is overwriting my existing RStudio installation. That would be okay because I don't... Okay. Oh, group RStudio server already exists. Okay, I must have installed it on this machine at one point. This is good to go. Um, oh, and it says it's actually running, process 3194. So let's take a look at this. PS, UX, um, grep. So PS, it shows you all running processes. Well, it shows you, sorry, um, experts, bear with me for a second here. PS just shows you what you're running. So there's PS I'm running in Bash. PS, PSA shows all my processes. PSAU, uh, X, um, shows like every process on the machine. And let me show you something kind of cool here. I'm going to widen up this window. This is a pretty neat trick that I knew 20 years ago and had forgotten. OK, I'm making this window. Um, PS, AUX, and then I go PS, AUX, WW, wide. So it, it'll actually, if you have if you have a line like this, um, this thing that's running in Java, that has the path attached to it. If you need to see all the parameters, you, you want to use the W. 
So like I just did there. So if I go ps aux grep, it just looks for things. The pipe ps command has output. It's going to pipe it. It's going to instead of putting it to the screen, it's going to give it to this command called grep. Pipe is really an important concept. If you don't know it, you should learn it. Uh, it's that funny little key above your enter key. Um, let's grep for 3194. And there it is. Um, I mean, you can see that we're running our you can see the grep command with 3194 found itself, uh, which you can suppress if you want. Um, and then you can also see user live RStudio server bin R server. Um, so the question is, what port is it running on? Now I'm in another window here. I'm actually looking at the docs. OK, I see the answer, but I'm going to show you something interesting here. There's another command. Let me make this, I'm going to make this whole window uh, wider. I, Hope you can still see what I'm doing here. Let me see. Let me bring this terminal window back on my main screen so I can see the hangout on my other screen. If you don't have two screens, you should. <laughs> if you're going to be a developer, you need two screens at least, preferably one of them that tilts on its side. Um, OK, so um, I'm going to show you another command. We're going to look at our studio in a second. I'm just trying to, let's say I don't know what port. I was able to look at the documentation and see what port it's running on, but let's say I don't have that. Um, if I go netstat, I believe dash a, it's going to show me all my ports. Um, did I see it in there? Yeah, that's funny that it's not really identifying itself properly. Um, there's there's more options for netstat. Let me go ahead. Um, netstat dash a um, head. If you look, this is actually where it's running. I'm, I'm not going to take the time right now, but there's an option for netstat that would show you the name of the process that's running it. So if we switch over to a browser, stop. And I don't know if you see it. Every time I click away from screen share, it momentarily flips the um, screen horizontally. So um, where's my browser? Is that my browser? Yeah. OK. Um, let's share that browser. So you see on this page here, you download and install. Um, and remember, we're going to go look at this through a web, a web browser. So it's saying it's on port 8787. Uh, one more thing for sort of newer people, if you don't know what that means, um, it's sort of like a P.O. box. I mean, you might have the address for your post office here um, but, or, or, you know, or the address for your, your company, but this would be like a, a mail stop. Effectively, uh, different services run on different ports. And so this is running on port 8787. So now if I come up here, and I go HTTP colon, let's see if it knows me as Jim. That's the host name. This may not work. Oh, cool, there it is. Sign into RStudio. Um, yeah. Um, servers, username, and password database. So I guess you, I'm just using my account from this machine here. OK. Um, so let's sign into RStudio. That's me. Um, there's my password. Sure, remember that. And that wasn't very painful, actually. It could not compare it to me trying to set up my debugger in Python. That was not too painful. So now you can see, I'm going to make this, um, well, I guess that's a good size. So you can see this is R. Um, let's do something interesting here. You know, I don't know. There's, I'm going to whet your appetite a little bit for next week um, when I'm going to get into something called Shiny. Um, R Studio and Shiny. Shiny is a way. I'll just show you real quick. Um, if I go to this, this URL, uh, you know, it's not letting, <laughs> it's actually not showing you the drop down and the, I think you can see the URL I'm typing in there, jimlosi.shinyapps.io. Oh, it's not there anymore. What happened? All right, let me divert for a second here. So if you're if you're still here at this point, you're you're really a propeller head and you're really interested in this stuff. Um, I'm going to go log in. Shiny Apps is a is a free site that lets you show off your R your R applications in Shiny. Um, what's my login here? My login. <laughs> uh, did I log in with GitHub? I think maybe I did. Yeah, I did. Here we go. One application online. Okay, here's my account. 
Um, let's go take a look at what's running. Nothing's running. Um, let's go look at applications that are sleeping. And you'll see this This is called Paul's R Reality. Paul's Reality. I'm trying to be cute with the word R. Um, we, we did this data competition. Um, I didn't do the analysis, so I don't take any credit for the accuracy of the analysis. Um, I just took the analysis in R. Well, I took the analysis that was done. Remember I, in the very beginning of the talk, I mentioned the REPL um, read, read, evaluate, print loop. I don't know why I couldn't remember that earlier. Read, evaluate, print loop. So this guy, he's not so much of a developer, um, but he's a really great statistician. And he, So he didn't put a script together for me. He just gave me a bunch of commands to run on the command line. Um, I took those commands and put them into a script. And this is this is the end product. And then I'm going to step through and show you. So, um, oh, that's why it didn't come up, because I had to put in the entire URL. Duh. I just haven't accessed this for like a month or something. And so the free account, normally the application is going to be sleeping, but when someone accesses it, it wakes up and it tracks the time, and I believe you get 25 hours a month. So he did this thing um, with uh, analyzing Utah weather data. There's a, let me show you something pretty cool. If you're in Utah or you're not in Utah, open data. Utah.gov. Um, the state of Utah has made all these data sets available. Your state probably has too. Um, so if you want to be a data scientist and you're looking for data, there's no excuse not to. You look around, everybody has open open data sets available. Um, so let's take a look here. This is what I built, this shiny app.io. You can, if you do a regular R script and, and plot a graph, it'll just do it statically. It'll just show the graph, but it doesn't give you controls. The cool thing about shiny is that it makes R come alive and it gives you gives the user control. So you see, you know, there's different data for different months. And as I as I bring up the different months, um, you can see the data changing. Um, there's cooler stuff to do with this. Uh, I have not made quadratic uh, linear regressions not really working. That's obviously not a proper linear regression. So there's a lot more to do. I had, I tried to put a color picker in here, but there's there's a bug. I don't know if it's a bug, but there's just something that wasn't quite implemented in the color picker that didn't work with shinyapps.io. So this is the end result. Let me show you how we got here. Um, I You can even look at this yourself. I'm going to go to uh, megalearningllc.com. Mega Learning is the company that I'm founding. I'm actually going to incorporate this in the beginning of the year. I was going to do it last month, but I figured why, why file an extra tax return. Um, so... I have this post here. Well, let's just go to the whole blog and take a look. And here it is, part two, install r, &R Studio. If you want to join me next week, um, you, should look, you should look at these pages. And if you, if you look at the event, it'll have the, a link to these pages in there. And what you should be doing is downloading. Um, where'd the files go? Here we go. Server.r and ui.r. These are... Once you install RStudio on your machine and get the latest version, um, let's see, if I just click this, will it download it? Oh, well, that's nice. I can just copy and paste. So this is server.r. So we're going to go to RStudio. We're going to do a new file. Yes, an R script. I'm going to paste in that code, and I'm going to save this. Uh, I'm going to save it in... Oh, why is it giving me... Not really giving me the proper uh, file browser here. Oh, you can. Yeah, that's cool. You can see that now. That's weird. I don't know why in Eclipse you couldn't see the pop-ups, but here you can. Um, how about a how about a directory called R? That sounds like a good place. I'm not gonna need this again. It's just temporary. And let's call it server. R. So the whole point about Shiny is you need two files. You need a file called server.r, um, and then you need a file called ui.r. Um, save link as, oh right, hello. Just click on it. There we go. Copy that. I'm going to go back to our studio. I'm going to do another new file here. And again, I don't actually know if this app stuff works in our studio. So this is where you really, you know, if you're going to do something like this, test, do a better job than I did today of testing stuff out in advance. I, I'm just going to actually say it at the end here. I apologize for not being prepared a couple times there, but at least you had time to go look you know, for more coffee or a bathroom break or something. Um, so you notice now we have two files here, one called server.r, one called ui.r, and hey, this works in our Studio server as well. You notice that this, 
you may not have noticed the absence of this button right here, but now you'll notice this button run app is here. Um, let's look at the components. This, the UI is the, the user interface, right? So um, you have the inputs here. Uh, the, the, really, the guts are more. I mean, this sets up a page with sidebar. It sets up a header. If you're if you're familiar with like Java, um, with like Swing or Java FX, uh, or probably C Sharp's, um, you know, Visual. What's it called? Visual Basic, not Visual Basic, but you know, Visual. Um, well, Visual C Sharp. You know, the the builders, the the GUI builders. Um, they have these ideas of panels, and then the guts kind of go on on the server here. You'll see that. Uh, there's something called a reactive. Here we go. It's reactive. This is the this is the key part that goes beyond just regular R and sets up a shiny app. Is these two files, server.r, ui.r, and then you're you're actually pointing um, a reactive function. That's letting it know that it has to keep on checking and see if the user's updated anything. And then you know down here is where you're actually seeing the plot being rendered. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and run the app. When we click this, it just runs it locally. Um, I did that. Let's see. Oh, what's going on here? We attempted, oh, pop-up blockers, yeah. Well, that's interesting. So, okay, in regular desktop RStudio, it has its own browser built in. Oh, but yeah, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> we're, since we're actually running in a browser, I just hit try again, and I guess it's going to work. Pretty cool. Um, I have to go share a different... Oh yeah, and that's why I was a little confused. This isn't the same app that we were looking at on Shiny Apps. This is one of the, the demos. Um, let me bring up this other window here. Um, here we go. This one's kind of cool. It has more color, so I'm, I'm a little happier to show you this one. Um, let's make it full screen. So this is letting you, as a user, in, in R, um, there's a... Oops a database called Iris that's built into R. Um, it's worth knowing that R has a few um, built-in databases. And one of them, like I said, is called Iris. So that's what this is using. And so we, you know, if you know what sepal is, something related to plants, so Iris is a plant. Uh, so it has data about the lengths and widths and colors and things of different uh, Iris petals. And you can change the, uh, you know, what's your Y variable. That's pretty nice. That looks like that's a pretty normally distributed function, I would say. You can see how many clusters are there up and down. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. I mean, when you take this and apply, oh, hey, I found a bug in their demo. When you, when you uh, apply you know, these kind of abilities to, to visualize and present things graphically to your own data, it can really make you stand out a lot as a, as a you know, quote, unquote, data scientist. Uh, open in browser. I am in a browser. So uh, I, I just want to show you the last thing. And again, hopefully I've whet your appetite a little bit for, for doing things like this, for exploring the different aspects of data science. Uh, if you have questions for me, I would encourage you to email them to me. I'll pop my email up on the screen here in just a second. Um, let me just look here. I just had to close that window. I'm just trying to figure out where's my other browser window. There it is. Cool. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot more to show you in R right now, um, except, you know, here, let's look at packages real quick. Um, packages, packages. In fact, you know, but, yeah, here we go. Packages, there it is. You can see that everything that's installed, and there's Shiny. That's, what, that's the package that we use to build this. Um, yeah, I think... I think I'm pretty much going to wrap this up today. I don't have any questions being asked. Um, and, yeah, I think I just want to show you one last thing here. Um, this is my website, um, Mega Learning LLC. I have a blog that I'm working on. There's there's a few blog posts in there. Um, this is really based on a, an effort that I'm doing to implement machine learning in call centers. It's a paper that we published in the, sp in the spring and in the summer. Um, here, I'll show you one more place. Um, if you go to Hol Holiday, Holiday is the city that I live in, holidaylabs.us, H-O-L-L-A-D-A-Y labs.us, then you can actually download um, PowerPoint slides, well, from my OpenWest presentation, so that's pretty much the, 
the slides that you just saw. And then you can actually, oh, I don't have it here. Well, I thought I had the actual uh, paper loaded up here, and I don't. So check back on these sites. Um, I would say if you're going to send me an email, send it to jim at megalearningllc.com. You can actually go to the website here, megalearningllc.com, and you can contact us. Um, if you're new, you'll get a little fly-in that asks you, oh, here you go. If you're, if you're new to the site, you'll get a little fly-in that asks you to sign up for the mailing list. I'd appreciate if you do that. Um, I would really appreciate if you, if you subscribe to this YouTube channel. If I can get 100, this is a brand new effort. If I get 100 subscribers, uh, then I can actually um, get a custom URL for my YouTube channel, which would be pretty cool. It would be pretty cool to have 100 subscribers. It would be a good start. Um, yeah, here, down at the bottom of this uh, mega learning site, I have the slides. That's the slides from the ASEE talk, which you may not find so interesting. Um, I did a presentation at my Toastmasters club. There's the slides. And then here's the actual paper. Let's see if we can view this here. And I'm just going to show you this. Um, oh, failed. Oh, okay. Well, I'll fix that. So by the time you watch this video, that should be working. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap it up here. Let me stop presenting. Oh, uh, stop. There we go. Okay, well, I just want to really thank everybody for coming and watching this video, especially if you're still here. I'm pretty impressed. It's an hour and 41 minutes after I started. Um, you know, a few things went wrong. This is my first hangout, so I, I'm just going to do, you know, what you're not supposed to do as a professional speaker is I'm just going to apologize a little bit. Um, I will have my, my, my demos together um, just for a little personal angle. A couple of nights, you know, it's in Utah. It's snowing quite a bit, and we have the freeze and thaw cycle. And on the last thaw cycle, my... Uh, my apartment building decided to dump a few gallons of water into my master bedroom. So I got kind of hung up one day dealing with a, a water leak and um, rearranging things. So I wasn't quite as prepared for this talk as I'd like to be. I promise you next week we're going to dig a lot deeper into R and Shiny Apps. I'll give a, a formal presentation from you know, soup to nuts of how to set up everything you just saw. Um, I may do this out of Windows. Forgive me if I do it from Windows and not Linux, but hey, we're supposed to be agnostic on on tools. And I'm just going to leave you with that one piece of advice. If you're watching this because you're a new data scientist and you're trying to pick up on these different tools, uh, a couple pieces of advice. Don't, don't let your head swell up. Um, I see people in some of these um, uh, vocational type schools or these, um, oh, what are they called? Not incubators, but you know, these like, we're going to make you a developer in six weeks. And you don't, you don't build a developer in six weeks, even if you pay $10,000 and spend three months. Um, it takes a lot longer than that to really get the nature of things. And I'm just going to say this and probably get in trouble. You notice computer people are not known for getting along all that famously with the rest of the world. Um, try to retain a little bit of humility and just realize that there's, there's always more stuff to learn. And don't get, here's my final point, is don't get tied to one tool. It's very popular to be, you know, I'm Apple, I'm Microsoft, I'm for Google, I'm for this, I'm for that. Um, some really smart people I know won't hire you if you're a tool snob, if you, if you want to do something in one tool and not another just because you think one is better than the other. You use the tool that's right for the job. You know, Microsoft has some great stuff. Google has some great stuff. Google has some bad stuff. But you take the good with the bad, and you use the right tool for the job. Um, well, again, thanks for showing up. I really appreciate that. Um, I don't think there's any last-minute questions, so I'm going to wrap this up. And I hope you have a great week, and we'll see you here next Saturday at 10 o'clock uh, Mountain Time, and we'll get into R and Shiny. And I believe the week after that, I think I said I was going to do Python, but we will, uh, or uh, Spark specifically. Okay, thanks a lot. And I'll actually do a trailer for the Spark thing, so look for that as well. And uh, have a great day.